Hello everyone. Welcome back. I'd like to continue on with part two of chapter two. This is where we ended up. We had just been talking about um, air circulation cells and how they cause areas of low pressure and high pressure and low precipitation and high precipitation. And the general idea um, that I'd like to, you to take away from this section is that the differential heating of Earth's surface by solar radiation gives rise to these atmospheric circulation cells which strongly determine Earth's major climate zones. Okay? All right, so winds, let's um, talk about uh, prevailing winds for a little bit here. Winds blow from area from high pressure to low pressure, and that results in what we call prevailing, the prevailing winds. Um, the winds appear to deflect instead of going in a straight line um, due to the Earth's rotation, and this is called the Coriolis effect. I've actually posted a video discussing the Coriolis effect for you, so I'd like for you to watch that um, in addition to viewing this lecture. And so, due to the Coriolis effect, surface winds blowing toward the equator from the high pressure zones at 30 degrees north and south, that's where the deserts are located, remember, are deflected west from the perspective of Earth's surface. These winds are called trade winds. Um, and alternatively, winds blowing from the poles from those zones of high pressure are called westerlies, and they're deflected to the east. Okay. Um, okay, so a process called upwelling happens when these prevailing winds blow parallel to a coastline. So deep, cold ocean water rises to the surface as warmer surface water is blown off of the coast. Um, so what you end up with is that warm surface water being replaced by very nutrient-rich, colder, deep ocean water. Here's what that looks like. You can see the wind blowing uh, parallel to the coast. And what happens is that um, uh, because the deep ocean is very sediment rich, with the cold water, upwellings bring up deep sediments. And it actually feeds these microscopic organisms called phytoplankton, which, um, uh, which actually derive their energy from sunlight, which in turn provides a food source for zooplankton, which feed on phytoplankton. And alternatively, well, in, in addition to, I should say, zooplankton, uh, their consumers are also provided a food source, so they increase. So this is why coastlines tend to be rich with um, different kinds of marine organisms. Okay, so it provides a food for phyto, phytoplankton, zooplankton, and um, these are the most productive um, areas. All right, what are we looking at here? This is something called the glo global, the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. And globally, ocean currents transfer heat from the tropics, the tropical areas where all that solar radiation hits directly to the poles. And it goes through a process called the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt, uh, which is basically a large-scale oceanic circulation pattern that is very important in establish establishing patterns of temperature and precipitation. And so what you can see here are generalized ocean currents and how they move globally. And for example, when this warm water current goes up here through the Gulf Stream, it's warm, um, coming from the tropics, and as it goes through these cold waters up here, um, 
the warm water gets cold and it sinks down to the bottom and then this cold this is a cold uh, deep water current that then continues down and around and um, again when it splits and goes back up near the tropics it warms up again and um, this is called the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. This distributes heat uh, and precipitation patterns all over the globe as we know them. So generally, average annual temperatures become progressively cooler once you move away from the equator. This is something that we talked about already extensively in part one of this video. Um, and I guess I just want right now to emphasize that this pattern is really dictated and altered by ocean currents, but also continental topography, things like elevation, um, and also the distribution of land masses and water masses. So how much land there is relative to how much water there is present in a given area. Um, the lapse rate is uh, basically a rule that says that as you go up in elevation, temperature goes down. So temperature decreases with increases of elevation. And it's due to two main things. One, air pressure and density decrease with elevation. There are literally fewer air molecules present to absorb infrared radiation um, at um, higher elevations. Also, wind speed increases at higher elevations due to less friction with the ground surface, surface. And um, for that reason, uh, temperature also decreases. Here's an image that I like to share that shows lapse rate with a parcel of air. If this parcel of air um, were 30 degrees Celsius at the surface of the Earth, it would be representative, uh, represented by something about this size. As it um, rises, as this air parcel, warm, hot air rises, it cools, it expands. Okay, see over here, as, airs, as the air parcel rises, the blue arrow, it cools and expands. So here, it's expanded, and it's 20 degrees Celsius now. If it keeps going further, it's 10 degrees Celsius. So the size of the parcel has expanded. The air molecules are further apart from each other, and it cools. When cold air sinks, it um, will uh, very often um, warm as it goes down, and it compresses back to a tighter, um, smaller-sized air parcel. So coastal areas have a climate that is described as a maritime climate. This is kind of, of an uh, ocean coastal climate where you have little daily seasonal variation in temperature and high humidity. Think of when you go to the beach, when you go to areas surrounding the beach, typically you go there because the climate is mild. There's not a drastic winter and um, a hot summer, usually um, it's more mild in its variation. Um, however, once you move to the center of large continents, then you get what's called a continental climate, where you have much greater variation in daily and seasonal temperatures, especially in those temperate zones that are um, away from the equator. Um, so uh, areas in the center of large continents, they're going to have a much greater, greater seasonal variation. So for example, you might have very cold, you know, cold winters and hot summers where you wouldn't have that in a maritime climate. So that's one way, that's another way that global climate is regulated, it's de dependent on where you are in relation to large bodies of water or where you are on the continent. All right, we talked about what happens when ocean currents meet uh, the coasts of continents. And 
uh, so, somewhat similar phenomenon, not really too similar, um, conceptually similar phenomenon happens when air masses meet mountain ranges. So when an air mass uh, meets a mountain range within a continent, that air mass is going to be forced upward over the mountain, where as it moves upward, remember it's going to do what? It's going to expand and cool. And what that is going to end up doing is releasing precipitation. And so there's something that uh, we call a rain shadow effect. North-south trending mountain ranges create a rain shadow effect. This is when windwards, the windward slope of um, the windward slope facing the prevailing winds has high precipitation and lush, lush vegetation and the leeward slope gets little precipitation. So the windward slope is the side that is facing the incoming wind, and the leeward slope is the opposite side. Let's look at a picture of a mountain so you can see what this rain shadow looks like, because it's hard to understand just from this description. So here's a rain shadow. You have your prevailing winds coming in, and um, over the water, they're warm. You can see that the air is um, holding a lot of moisture because warm air holds moisture. As it moves up over the mountain, it, it's going to cool and it's going to start to form clouds. Those clouds are going to release precipitation and then that air is going to move back over the mountain and sink down and warm back up again but it's released all of its precipitation, so um, it's dry on the leeward side of the mountain. So precipitation is found on what we call the windward side, and on the leeward side of the mountain, um, you have dry conditions. And this is due to what we talked about um, already back in the first part of Chapter 2. This would be an example of latent heat release due to a phase change. So vegetation and land cover can also influence climate, specifically um, what that land cover looks like from, um, from space, from, um, from up top. And albedo is the amount of solar radiation that the surface on the Earth reflects. So light colored surfaces have a high albedo. Dark colored surfaces, something like concrete, have a low albedo. So albedo, it's the amount of solar radiation reflected. So um, an example here, a coniferous forest, um, if you're looking down at it from outer space, it would have a dark color and therefore um, that would uh, have, if it had a darker color, it would have a lower albedo than something that would have bare soil or uh, maybe dormant grassland that would absorb more solar energy. Let's look at a picture with some different surfaces to compare for albedo. So light colored surfaces like ice, snow, they have higher albedo than other surfaces. Therefore, they're reflecting more solar radiation back into space. Dark colored surfaces absorb a lot of that solar radiation and therefore increase the temperature on the surface of the Earth. So you're going to actually have a class, act, um, an online activity that you'll complete uh, talking about albedo. So this is something that you'll that you might want to come back to when you complete that activity. All right. Very briefly, um, this is showing you why we have seasons. I posted a video that is dynamic and is. Um, a great explanation of what you're looking at here in this figure. But what you're looking at here is the fact that the Earth is tilted on an axis. And this axis is 23.5 degrees. And um, not only is the Earth tilted on an axis, it also ro rotates. And it rotates once every 24 hours. And then it orbits around the Sun, which is in the center of this diagram, 
once every 365 days. And what you're looking at is the position of the Earth over um, four quarters of the year. And you can see how, depending on where you're located, it's kind of showing us where we would be located during these times. Because um, this is showing you North America, United States is, is over here. But at different times, you can see, um, for example, um, that the sun is closer to um, you know, any given area at different times of the year. And sometimes it's going to be darker. Sometimes days are going to be shorter. And that's all due to its re the relative location of the Earth in its rotation around the sun. Okay, so definitely watch the video that talks about this in more, uh, more depth. All right, um, I'd like to end today's uh, part two of chapter two um, just mentioning the fact that there's lo been long-term variation in climate that's been researched. It's well documented that over the past 500 million years that there have been very cold times and very warm times. It's not unusual that there's variation in the Earth's temperature over time. Um, so this is looking over a very long time period. You can see that um, there's ups and downs. And if we kind of, um, you know, go over to this area over here on the curve, um, uh, um, on this figure. Oh, something I'll mention is that... Um, it's well established that warmer periods um, are associated with higher concentrations of greenhouse gases. That's something that we talked about during part one of the chapter two lecture that's posted on Canvas. If we go back about 400,000 years ago, what you see here looks like a pretty well established pattern. And these are what we call ice ages. Um, ice ages are glacial, interglacial cycles where the Earth basically freezes over and, <coughs> excuse me, then um, interglacial would be between that freezing period. These cycles that occur at frequencies about every 100,000 years. We are right now, obviously, in an interglacial period. Otherwise, um, it would, we would be living in an ice age. And these have typically lasted about 23,000 uh, years in the past this interglacial period. Um, the last glacial maximum was about 18,000 years ago. So this just gives you perspective that this is something that happens over long-term periods. Um, and I wanted to introduce you to why we have these glacial, interglacial cycles. They're explained by regular the very long-term changes in the shape of the Earth's orbit and the tilt of its axis. And we, can, we call the combination of these changes Milankovitch cycles. And there are three components to Milankovitch cycles that I'd like you to be familiar with. And so um, I'll go through and show them to you right now. And then I've also posted a video that I'd like for you to watch that talks um, about Milankovitch cycles just in a little bit more detail. But um, uh, in combination, Milankovitch cycles explain um, historic patterns of climate change. And the first co uh, component of Milankovitch cycles is eccentricity. Eccentricity is about the shape of the Earth's orbit, being either more round or more um, oblong. And that cycle changes um, over every 100,000 years. Okay, and I'm going to show you a picture of each of these things in a moment as well. Um, obliquity, the angle of the Earth's uh, tilt actually changes in cycles about every 41,000 years. We call this obliquity. And then the Earth's orientation relative to other celestial objects uh, present is, is changes in cycles uh, of about every 22,000 years. We call that precession. And that's kind of like wobbling on, on the Earth's axis. 
Um, let's look at a picture of each of them. This is eccentricity. Okay, um, so you can uh, read in your book about, um, and you can probably imagine just looking at this picture about how over this um, large time period, the Earth's climate might change being closer to the sun versus further from the sun. The further from the sun you are, you're going to be in an ice age. The closer you are to the sun, you're going to be in an interglacial period. Obliquity. Um, this is just showing the variation in the Earth's tilt over time. And this is precession. This is the wobbling on the Earth's axis. And again, these things don't work independently. They act in combination to cause long-term patterns of glacial interglacial periods. So I hope that that was a good introduction to Milankovitch cycles. Again, I would watch the video clip that I posted um, just to make sure that you get all that information clearly. Okay? Thanks, guys.